1 John 3. Hear these words. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that we did not know him. Beloved, we are called God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. But what we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. So you know that he was revealed to take away sin. And in him, there is no sin. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love not in word or in speech, but in deed and in truth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Well, you might have noticed. Uh, ooh, we all right? We good? Check. Hey, let's go. Praise God. Praise God. Satan's been going after technology today, but we ain't going to have none of that. All right. Well, you might have noticed your bulletin says Pastor John, and I'm not Pastor John. I'm sorry. I'm James Richards. I'm the student ministry director here at Lakewood Methodist Church. Um, Pastor John, unfortunately, is not feeling well this morning. So what I thought, what I'd like to do, um, you know, as we are all family here to pray over Pastor John together to start our time. Um, and I almost, I don't know if this would be weird, but I'd love if we could kind of extend a hand and just pretend like John is here in between us. But Lord, we just come, we bring Pastor John before you. We know he's not feeling well. Um, so Lord, we just pray over him. We pray for your healing, for your rest for him. He is our, our uh, shepherd under the leadership of the Good Shepherd. Um, and pastor just so well. So we just pray uh, that you would be with him this morning um, and give him the, the rest and the healing he needs from the great physician. And Lord, um, we just pray that you'd come and meet with us here. And we just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would take us wherever you want to go. Because um, I don't know where we're going, but uh, you do. So Lord, lead us. And we just, we yield this time to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I love this scripture of 1 John 3 that talks about a, a father and a child and this, this idea of family. So I want to start by sharing um, a little story that's become really key to my understanding who God is from my childhood. Um, but I was in about sixth or seventh grade. We'd just gotten back from a church retreat. Um, and my little middle school group and I were hanging out waiting to get picked up from our parents, um, and we noticed that there were just a good pile of a good throwing rocks just laying there, and we're standing outside the church, and we're kind of pushing each other around, and we grab some rocks, and we're kind of throwing them at each other, and then I realized that, so this was in sixth grade, there was this seventh grade girl that I had a crush on at the time, and she was standing over there a good yonder's ways away, but not too yonder's far for a good stone's throwing, and she had had no idea I was living or breathing during that retreat, but I thought, you know what would make her know that I'm living and breathing is if a good old rock came her way, and it would bounce off her head, and she would immediately think, wow, what a display of athleticism. What a display of a baseball arm. He's going to go play pro. And, and all of my dreams of this girl noticing me would be accomplished. So I, like David and Goliath, went and I selected my stone from the riverbank, and I got ready, and I gave it a good crow hop, but I'm right-handed. So I gave it a good crow hop, 
And I sent it her way and sent it flying, and I waited, and I waited, and oh, she's going to notice me now. And then nothing happened. She didn't even flinch. And I was like, man, that girl either took that like a champ and has a really hard head, or I missed. Um, I don't know what happened, but uh, she didn't flinch, so I go back hanging out with my buddies, and then one of my other middle school buddies comes up, and he's like, hey, James, did you happen to see where your rock landed? I was like, Obviously didn't hit her, so I don't know why it matters. Um, and he's like, no, James, let me draw your attention to the 10-foot-tall stained window um, that is here that now has this itty-bitty hole in it from your rock. And we all kind of look at it together, and we're like, well, you think anybody would notice? And then just as we said that, like, you could hear it just starts crackling down on the sides, and you can just see the lines starting to run through this 10-foot-tall stained glass window. It was orange. <sighs> and my buddy looks at me, and he's like, James, you know what you have to do now, right? You have to run. <laughs> I was like, no, Drew, I, I can't run. There's, there's a lot of witnesses here. Um, I, think, I think everyone knows it was me at this point, because like a crowd had gathered. Um, so I go into the youth pastor's office. Some of y'all know Clay Smallwood. Clay was one of my youth pastors growing up. So I go sit down and meet with Clay. Um, and I'm terrified. And I, I'm sitting there and I'm like, Clay, I broke this window. Um, you know, I, I don't know what we need to do about it. And he's like, well, James, you realize that window costs $4,000. And now you're going to be the one to pay for that. And I just remember sitting there as a sixth, seventh grader being like, my life is over. Like, I'm dead. Life doesn't go on after this. I don't have $4,000. I don't even know what $4,000 looks like. That's probably like not that far off from a million dollars. I mean, like, there's no way. But, but I start thinking, I'm like, well, you know, if I could go buy a lawnmower, Maybe I can find one on Craigslist for 10 bucks because that's what I've got. And if I can go get a lawnmower and mow a bunch of yards, if I mowed like four yards, you know, every day for the next six months, like maybe I get enough money and my mind's just racing. Um, because what I was sitting there thinking is I've got to have a plan for when my dad gets here. And I've got to have a plan like in the next five minutes because that's when he's coming. And I can tell you there's been a lot of times in my life where being a part of a great family has been a comfort to me, um, but being a part of a family in that moment was not comforting. Because my dad grew up in the age of the Iron Belt, the Iron Age, as, as he would call it. And um, I, I knew a reckoning was coming because I had done messed up. And I just kind of sat there in Clay's office waiting, waiting for, for the wrath to come. And it struck me because I feel like this is similar to maybe points in our life that we've experienced before. Maybe we've had points where we've messed up or we've broken something or something looks impossible for us to be able to remedy or to fix. And it's there right within grasp, but we just were powerless to do anything about it. Um, and to tell you the truth, um, the one who was coming that could do something about it, I was terrified of. I was terrified of what my dad was going to say when he saw it. And I think if we're being real, there's a lot of times we're terrified of what would happen if Jesus walked into our room that we've made a mess of. If he stepped into those broken places of our life that, that we've misconstrued or broken the lamp in, um, what would Jesus have to say about that? But what I'm excited for is I think in our verse this morning, we get just a little picture of what Jesus does have to say about that. So if you've still got your Bibles out, chapter 3, verse 1. We're just going to start with one verse. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And I want us to just stop right there for now. Um, but I want us to just highlight this word lavish for just a second. Everybody say it together. Lavish. Lavish. Sorry, I, I teach student ministry. I may make you say a lot of things together. Um, it sticks for me. It works for me. 
Um, but lavish. When we talk about the love of God, it is not enough. It is not sufficient. It is not like, here's what you need. Lavish is like, here's what you need, and here's a whole lot more. Like, here's way more than you need of my love, abundance of my love. When I think of lavish, I think about a guy that a lot of y'all know here named Thomas O'Quinn. Um, but Thomas sometimes just like in a normal week will come see us up in our offices and he'll be carrying these two giant bags um, from Chapel Hill Barbecue. And he'll be like, I was just driving past into church and I thought, man, I bet those student guys are hungry up there and I bet Jessica could use a pie or some sweet. So he, he starts opening up the things that he's brought and I'm expecting like, oh, a breakfast taco would be nice. And he's like, so... They had six different kinds of kolaches, and I don't know what y'all like, so I bought all of them. And then I thought, you know, y'all probably want some donuts, right? So here's a dozen donuts. And then I thought, y'all got to eat lunch, right? So here's some barbecue that you might need for that. And then what everybody needs after a good barbecue is you got to have something sweet to, to put on top of your barbecue, and they have, like, the best pies at this place. So there's, like, 20 different pies, and he's like, I don't know what they like, so I'll just buy all of them. So here's 20 slices of pie in different flavors. And I'm like, Thomas, how big do you think I am, man? Like, I don't even know how I would begin to go about eating a fraction of that. And he's like, dude, don't even worry about it. If you want, just take a bite out of each pie. I just wanted you to savor it. I just wanted to bless you in that way today. Like, just taste them and enjoy it. And it, like, so much abundance, like we're having to, to literally clean out the fridge to store all of it for the week. And I just really think that that is just a sliver of what the lavished love of God looks like. When God's just like, you want my love and you're hungry for it? I'm not serving you a meal like, here's a plate, here's a plate, here's a plate, here's a plate. Like, let's set the banquet hall of it. Like, I'm going to stuff you till you can't feel any more of it because my love is lavished on you. And here's the thing about Thomas. Like, Thomas isn't like, oh, and by the way, you know, this was the bill. Just keep that in mind. No, Thomas is like, I just want this to be a blessing. Like, I'm not even worried about the cost of it. And I feel like, like with the Lord, like, it's just like more than enough. Don't even think about like, like all that you can imagine. Like, don't even mention it. Here you go. Here's everything you need. Lavish love of God. But here's the thing, though. You would think the story would end there, right? Lavish love is great. We all receive love. Everybody's happy. But then we hit a roadblock in verse 4. So if you're still with me, you might want to look at verse 4. So in verse 4, we hit this word called sin. It says, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Scripture is really, really clear that we have this issue of sin and that everyone has this same issue. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin, as it says in Romans 6.23, is death. So we've all done it and we're all guilty of death and we all have this problem here now. We've hit this roadblock. And what I feel like as the church and me personally, I have this really tough time reconciling, okay, I've got this problem and I've got this brokenness and I've got this lavish love of God and how in the world do those two things connect? Because kind of like little James sitting there in Clay's office, my plan as soon as I broke the window was not to be like lavish love. It was like I've got to fix this. I've got to gather up the pieces of this stained glass window. Like, I've got to figure out a business plan to pay it off. Maybe I can go get some Gorilla Glue from the store, and we can, like, hold it up and start putting it back together. And I just feel like in our lives, so often, we have this brokenness in our life or things that we've broken or things that other people have broken in us, and we're just, like, trying to scoop it all together and put it back together and make it work and fix it because we're in this culture that says, you've got to fix it. We're in this culture that says, you broke it, you buy it. You pull yourself up. You make a way. That's, that's what the world tells us, right? Right? So we, we try to do that. 
And our life becomes like this stained glass window that the more and more that we try to just scoop it up together, like the glass cuts our hands and it's like our blood is bleeding all over this broken glass of shards that we're trying to put back together. And God's standing over here like, did you forget I laid out a banquet of my lavish love? Would you like some of that? And we're like, no, God, stay away from me with your lavish love. I've got this. Can you not see? Like, I don't want you to come over here. I'm worried you're going to be upset. You're going to be wrathful. Like, you can't handle this, but I, I can handle it. I've got it. Leave it. And, and meanwhile, my, our own blood out of our hands are pouring into the broken shards of glass as we try to pick it up and we try to fix it. We try to make it work because we don't want the Father to come into our place of brokenness. We can do it on our own, right? We can do it on our own. So my dad did get there. I wanted my dad to get there in like a year and a half after I had fixed it all. I mean, I don't, I don't know if he'd have showed up in 15 years if I would have had the money to, to fix it all. But he got there in five minutes, thank the Lord. And already dad walks in and I jump up and I'm like, dad, I've got a plan. I'm gonna go get a lawnmower. Like, I'm sorry, it's all gonna work out. And my dad's like, no, son. I need you to leave the room right now. I'm going to take care of this. And I was like, yeah, I, I, know, I know you're going to take care of it, but that's kind of what I'm afraid about, and I, I'd like to take care of it. And he's like, no, son, I'm going to take care of this. I need you to leave the room right now. So I did, and I left the room, and my dad takes care of it. And we get back in the car, and we got a pretty long drive back to our house, so the first 25 minutes, we're just sitting there in silence. And I finally worked up enough courage. I was like, James, you know, you could get in a little, you could probably get in a pretty decent defense right now. Like, he can't get his belt off while he's driving and reach across yet. So, like, use this drive time to start laying out your plan. So I'm like, Dad, you know, I didn't get a chance to tell you because you told me to leave, but, but I'm going to pay this off. And I'm so sorry. I messed up. I know I shouldn't have done it. Um, you know, but I've got this plan. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mow yards or whatever I need to do, and I'm going to get the money. And my dad just looks at me, and he's like, James, just stop. Just stop. And I think sometimes in our life, as we're just sitting there bleeding over our, our pile of brokenness, I think God sometimes looks at us and he's like, just stop. Would you just stop? You're hurting yourself. You're hurting other people. It's hurting me watching you hurt. Just stop. Because then we get to verse 5. This is the stop moment. Verse 5 is the stop moment. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness, but you know that he appeared, he being Jesus. Jesus appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. See, my dad looked at me, still silent. He says, son, I know you messed up. I think we're pretty on the same page that you messed up. I think you got that. I think we're there. But here's the thing, son. You didn't factor in something. You didn't factor in that you are my kid, and I love you. I love you so much. And I know, James, that if you slaved away, I don't know, for the next 10 years, you might not gather $4,000 to be, be able to pay off the debt that you now owe. I'm aware of that. So what I did, son, is I went and I paid that for you. I covered it in full. And in fact, I covered it so that you don't have to go live in this slave mindset of being in debt to something but that in fact, I believe God has something greater for you, and I don't want this to hold you back from it. So I paid your debt, and you don't ever need to bring it up again. It's done, and we're going to move on. And as I reflect back to that moment, number one, I am blown away by the grace and the mercy of my dad. But even more so, number two, is that it has absolutely radicalized how 
I view the love that God has for you and for me. Because this is just a sliver. This is just a picture. See, the thing is, is that God, our Father, who was lavishing love out to us, he saw us in this broken state, bleeding over the shards of glass that we were trying to put back together. And he saw that we owed this debt that we could not pay. And our Father said, you know what I will do about that? I will leave the throne room of heaven. I will step down into the shards of glass and into the mess that you've made. And I am willing to get cut. And I am willing to bleed to go in and to restore. And the things that you have broken, I will pour my own blood out on. And the cuts that you have on your hands, will you be reminded that I had nails go through my wrists for you? I will go and be laid upon a cross to do whatever it takes so that you might be restored and that you will no longer live in the debt of slavery and sin that had ownership of you because I have better things in mind for you. I have more planned for you. That is not your life anymore. And I will not let this thing that thinks that it has a grip on you, sin thinks it has a grip, Satan thinks it has a grip to just pull you down and keep you bleeding in your mess. But God said, my blood covers over that and I'm inviting you out of it. Get out of there. You're not in this mess anymore. My blood is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. And not only is it sufficient, it is lavished over you. So you have more than enough. You have more than enough. Guys, if you're sitting in in your brokenness and the things that you've broken, would you just stop? Would you just look up and go, Father, I can't pay the debt I can't fix what's broken. And I'm just accepting the humility that I need somebody bigger and greater than myself to come and clean up this mess. There's this uh, Japanese pottery that I think is so, so cool, but um, this Japanese pottery called, uh, I'm going to mess this up, but Kintsugi. Everybody say Kintsugi. Let's say it again, Kintsugi. Kintsugi is there's a a master potter, and he takes and gathers in these pots that have been broken and damaged, and that the world says those are pots that are meant to go in a garbage can. But a master Kintsugi artist will take these broken pots, and he will spend great amount of time and hours to melt down refined gold, and he will use molten gold to fill in the cracks to meld that pot back together in a way that it is more beautiful and restorative than when it was when it began. And it becomes a vessel that is actually has greater value um, and, and is totally restored to a place of greater beauty than it ever had before. And guys, I think that is a picture for us that in the brokenness of our lives, we have to take the broken pieces to the master potter. And we have to let the blood of Jesus, like the gold that runs through the cracks of that potter, meld us back together into something more beautiful than when we began. To be a vessel with a purpose. God doesn't just call us out for nothing. He says, now you have purpose. Now you are my child. Now come be a part of the family business. And I'm in the family business of loving and restoring people. So let's go. Let's get to work. Let's go love people. And this love that I've lavished over onto you when I've given you 10 pies, go out into the streets and give out the pies to the people in the streets when you've had enough. Let's go share the lavish love of God. Because if you skip down, this is our last time we're going to dive back into the word, but I think this is so good. Uh, It's 1 John 3, 16 to 18. This is our response to the lavish love of God. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So my prayer as we close this morning um, is, number one, if you have not received the lavish love of God, I would, I would pray for nothing more that, that you would receive that this morning, that you would know that God loves you 
and that the lavish love that he spilled out was actually meant and intended to cover our brokenness and our sins. So if you're sitting and you came in thinking, I'm going to church, but I'm too far gone because of my past, I just think you need to hear this morning that that lavish love was actually poured out for you, and it's the reason that Jesus came. And then if, if it's been a while since you've received that, I just hope that you're reminded that God doesn't stop lavishing love over his kids. Um, my dad lavished that love over me, but he has continued to just lavish love for the remainder of my life. And can I tell you, at 28 years old, that happened when I was in sixth grade, my dad has never once brought that up to me again. In fact, what I have done is I've gone back and told my dad, Dad, I've probably preached about that story 10 times now. You have no idea what that has done in my life that I've been able to share that with other people. And I think that's the whole point is that once we receive this lavish love, this amazing thing was done in me. I'm this pot of gold now because of the blood of Christ. Now I'm ready to go pour that out onto other people. I was worried that my father might go tell other people about my brokenness and my addiction, but now I'm ready to go scream it from the rooftops because this is what Jesus did in me and somebody's got to hear about it. Because when they hear what Jesus did in me, it's going to change somebody else. And that person might change somebody else. And guys, that's the gospel. That's the church unleashing. Is when we're not afraid and we stop trying to cover the broken shards of glass. And we say, yep, Jesus bled over that. He restored it. Let me show you the, the, the product that's not finished, but he's still working on me. Come and, and let's, let's gather your broken pieces too. Let's gather those pieces together and let's go bring them to the potter. Let's go bring them to the master potter together. There's lavish love for you. So maybe there's somebody on your mind this morning that needs to hear about the lavish love of God. Let's pray together. God, you are so, so good. We don't deserve any of it, and yet you lavish love. You call us your child. You redeem what we broke. And then you send us out to go and, and get to walk in step with you as you redeem other people. It's amazing. It's so life-giving. It's our purpose. It's to come alongside you, Lord, as you're redeeming the world and say, I just want to be a part of it. Lord, I just want my story to, to be a part of what you're doing, God. I just want to scream from the rooftops what you're doing in me. Lord, would you unleash us from this place, receiving your lavish love to go and, and shout it from the rooftops what you're doing because you have so much to do in this area. Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus over this church. We plead the blood of Jesus over everyone sitting here. We plead the blood of Jesus over our schools. We plead the blood of Jesus over our places of work, over our homes, over our families. God, we need your redeeming blood because we can't do it on our own. We can't fix it, and we're done trying. We're stopping now. Come, Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.